So I'm Dr. Jeff Cantor. I'm a pediatric dentist. Uh, professionally, I am the director of the Easter Seals Dental Program for developmentally disabled patients. We see um, all kinds of developmental disabilities, but as autism has become the fastest growing uh, developmental disability, we're seeing a disproportionate number of children with autism relative to the other disabilities. Um, so I've got a, a great deal of experience with, with seeing children on the spectrum. I've been the dental consultant to Autism One since the first uh, Autism One conference in 2002, so this was my eighth year presenting. So um, I've got a lot of experience in, in, uh, with children on the autism sp spectrum, and I've been a uh, pediatric dentist since 1974, so I've seen a lot of, a lot of children with dental issues, and um, so I'd like to think that I can contribute to the issues that children on the spectrum have. Treating children with disabilities, specifically autism, um, is, is there any preparation that you suggest to the families before they come in? What, what, or what can a parent do to reduce the stress no. that the visit to you well, might Well, certainly the, the first thing I think you want to do is make sure you're going to the right pediatric dentist. Or if you don't have a pediatric dentist in your town or travel is prohibitive, or you, you learn of a general dentist who's got a lot of experience with children on the you know uh, spectrum because there's plenty of dentists who have children on the autism spectrum maybe even a disproportional amount I, I don't I don't know if it's studied but I personally know of several um, that's an important thing the other thing to decrease the the stress for the parent is be the first patient in the morning start early no one else in the office that's what we we you know do because that way if the child has a difficult time, the child has a bad day, a meltdown or whatever, it's only you and your child. And if the dentist and the staff un understands, it takes the whole embarrassment thing where people think that, you know, you've got a crazy kid or you're a terrible parent and all those issues that surround children's behavior in public, quote unquote, where the world doesn't get it. So I think those two things make it a lot, lot easier. It may not be, um, a pleasurable ex experience or that positive experience, but it will be no, no, you know, worse than taking your kid to a, other places uh, that are potentially sh sh stressful and won't be. You know, take that embarrassment point out because I've heard from a lot of parents that you know they avoided like the play because of the how they feel during the visit and you know and afterwards. So picking the right dentist is, I would say, the most Im 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 important thing, and I would certainly do my homework with other parents. I mean, net, networking is good because there are a lot of, of good, you know, dentists, but there are also a lot of dentists that really, sh you know, have, don't have the background, don't have the interest. You want to avoid them and find, find, find the best, you know, people. So network first, call, you know, the office, ask, ask your, your questions. If you have a specific question you want to talk to the doctor about, um, Try to work out a mutually agreeable time to talk, talk to the you know dentist. The dentist will, will not do it, won't get on the phone with you. I would not go. Find somebody who, who will spend the time. I'm sure you have um, parents that avoid coming um, because of sensory issues. Well, right. for for their children, and when they come, they may have um, extensive dental issues that need to be addressed. Do you find are you able to? work on the majority of these children or when would you suggest that a parent needs to um, look into sedation, some type of sedation? Well, the earlier we can see the child, the less chance of um, having extensive treatment needs, number one. Um, and the better, best chance do we have to not to have, have to revert to sedation, but the world being the way it is, including with neurotypical children, a lot of times the parents are not aware of just the extent of the problem, or they know the kid's got a cavity and they turn out to have 14 because they can only see the biggest hole and they can't see the uh, cavities that we see on x-ray, for example. So the sooner you can bring your child, the you know, up, you know better. So if a child is diagnosed at two, though, or two and a half, the first thing you're going to do is not go to the pediatric dentist. That's going to be 
way down down the uh, list. So reality is, people are going to bring their kids with autism, um, maybe the same time that people bring their kids who don't have autism. So ideally, we want to see a kid at one, but we see a lot of kids at three or you know four, and that's where the extensive the K comes in, and that's where the sedation comes in. So we will try not to sedate a child, um, but if the if the cooperation is such that we can't get anything done except examine the uh, teeth, then we don't have a choice. Or if there's just such extensive um, treatment needs, then we won't have a choice either. If a parent, um, you know, if you were suggesting sedation for a child, what, what could they expect? I mean, how would, would that work for a child? Is it something that's usually done in an office or? Well, in, in our practice, because we're fortunate enough to have a very talented dental anesthesiologist in our area who's got a lot of experience, extremely well trained, hospital trained, and has extensive experience with children on the you know, uh, spectrum. If the child is healthy, then treatment in and the office is a as a option. Not necessarily, I mean, that the final decision is made by the dental anesthesiologist with the pediatrician and the you know, our parent. The other option being the surgery center or the hospital. We try to avoid the hospital because of cost. A lot of times the insurance companies will not um, cover it in the hospital uh, and say you have to go to the surgery center or um, they'll only cover X number of dollars and anything over it will be, will be the patient's uh, responsibility, which bottom line is they're going to go to the uh, surgery center. So basically in our office the option is surgery center, um, which is but then you get an anesthesiologist in a in a um, non-hospital but otherwise identical surgery suite or in the office. There's advantages and disadvantages. The advantages if the office is basically for the dentist, the equipment is what we're used to using. Uh, we have our staff right you know there are all of our staff um, and you're going to get the, the um, Sometimes it's faster. We can do the work faster, and sometimes we can have less compromise. We also control the temperature of the you know, our materials of the work area. We do what we usually do. Um, the but the downside is that you know if there's an an unforeseen uh, situation, the dental anesthesiologist only has two hands. You don't have all hands on on your deck, and you can't have four or five people on the spot. And so, of course, we try to avoid things uh, that are not class one risk, but emergencies can happen. So that is a that is a difficult decision, which in every situation is, you know, a different. But those are in office two of the options, but the children's hospitals provide, most of them, that have dentistry, and most do have dentistry, provide that service done on an outpatient procedure. You go in early in the morning, Get the treatment done. We, you know, you'll cover. Go home the same, you know, day. And the anesthesia in children's hospitals is usually the best. Now we have a good bulk of our community that um, are concerned about what type of materials they're putting into their child's mouth. What? And I understand that most dentistry, um, if not all, have metal ions. Right. So what what do you suggest when you have a parent that has a concern about putting something like an amalgam in? Right. What what is the alternative? Right. Yeah. Well, amalgams in our office we would not do. So the alternatives are composites, which are plastic tooth colored fillings, which contain a whole slew of chemicals. However, none of them have been implicated to be a problem with children on the spectrum, and hope and I hope that they never never will. As far as the neurotoxicity of 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 what's in our materials versus mercury, since mercury is such a toxic material, um, it's it's controversial between organized dentistry and um, and a lot of folks in our community about just how toxic. It is, but no one's going to debate that mercury itself is, you know, a toxic. The question is when it's used in an amalgam. Amalgam is a combination of mercury with something else, with silver, just how, how toxic it is. But th in my mind, there's enough evidence to, you know, say that we should not be using it with children on the spectrum for sure. 
And then the other argument is we shouldn't even be using it for any siblings. And other people say we should be using it for children under four. And other people say we should be using it at all.